So the only thing maybe I would mention, and maybe you can, uh, in addition to uh, listening to Laurie without the slides you can think of, is um, um, that Kumar is the, not the only person who had a birthday um, last week. So did Laurie. Um, and Kumar's birthday, uh, I can tell you, is a product of four primes. Three of them are distinct. And Laurie's birthday is a product of three distinct primes. So you can probably figure out how old they are. So why don't you start, and I'll just try and get there. OK. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk, give you a quick summary of the um, project on device-to-device uh, -device and device-to-relay device uh, communications. The project is funded by Ericsson and Huawei. Uh, the PI is Pam Cosman, and there are four of the faculty involved, uh, Young Han, Kim, uh, Tara Javidi, Bhaskar Rao, and myself. Um, and so device-to-device -device is um, has becoming progressively more and more of interest uh, primarily because of the desire to increase the spectral efficiency. In other words, to reuse frequencies within a cell um, that otherwise couldn't be reused. Uh, it makes primary use of distance uh, variations and distance dependencies, uh, uh, whether two people are, are electrical, two users are electrically close enough to one another so they could actually reuse the same frequency that is currently be used in a cellular manner. And so uh, one problem it immediately causes is that of interference. In other words, you can use either downlink frequencies or uplink frequencies, and you have the same problem either way. Uh, it appears that ultimately the, the uplink frequencies will be used for device to device because the downlink frequencies are much more congested, especially so for an application like video, which is very bandwidth demanding. But in any event, if you're using a downlink frequency, surely the, the D to D receiver is getting interference from the base station. Okay, and the cellular transmitting emitter is getting interference from the D to D transmitter. Can you get us the slide from the um, from the um, memory stick? The, on the memory stick, there should be a slide maybe named uh, Laurie Milstein or something. The, the one that says research review, Larry, just go down three from that. Actually, I can see it if you give me control here. Okay, this is it? Okay, cool. Right. That's not it, right? Yeah, that's the first one. And this, this will be the second? Right. Yeah. yeah, okay. So can you project? Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so in any event, um, I guess I've already said this. So I'm gonna overview four projects. Uh, uh, and uh, the first one is, uh, uh, the work of Thuang Bang Nguyen, a doctoral student of Bhaskar Rao, and it is in fact the, uh, it's pretty much the problem, the, the obvious problem that I spoke about uh, a couple of minutes ago, and in fact um, uh, these two figures right here uh, illustrate what's going on in both the downlink and the, and the uplink. Uh, the, the, there's no way you can avoid that type of interference, or whether or whether it's going to be inherent. The question is how can you compensate for it? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so in any event, uh, the approach that um, Bhaskar is taking on this is, is the following. Uh, the idea is to make use of the extra resources 
the power of the base station in terms of beam forming, in terms of signal processing, in terms of raw power, and uh, alleviate uh, most of these considerations from the uh, device, the D2D -D users. So in particular, the D -D in, in this formulation, the D2D -D users only need to set up their links on the basis of signal-to-noise ratio, not signal-to-noise plus interference ratio. And the interference is accounted for okay, uh, by the base station itself, by the, by the cellular infrastructure. So for example, in this slide you're looking at, if you look on the uh, left-hand side, the downlink frequency, uh, reuse, and you look on the left-hand side of that slide, you see a, an interference link from the base station to the um, D to D receiver. Well, um, in this particular mechanism that uh, Bhaskar and his, and his student have devised, that link would be nulled out vis-a-vis -vis beam forming at the base station. Okay. And a similar uh, task would be performed if you were using an uplink frequency, uh, the link on the right from the cellular device to the uh, uh, D to D device, that would be, uh, you would use orthogonal beam vectors, okay, uh, to null out that particular guy. The problem being the following. I, I've actually said pretty much everything on, on this slide with except for the last bullet. Uh, if you simply try and zero the interference out, you're of course doing, um, you're helping out tremendously the D to D, but you're potentially killing off the cellular link. So that's a bit of an overkill. For example, if you look at this slide here and you look at the breakpoint, well, what are you looking at? So you're looking at the uh, signal to noise plus interference ratio on the uh, ordinate scale and a beam forming uh, tunable parameter uh, on the abscissa. So it doesn't matter what you're tuning, okay? If you look at the blue horizontal line at the top, that's the signal-to-noise ratio of the cellular user in the absence of interference. And if you look at the um, horizontal red line, uh, two-thirds uh, halfway down the, the slide, that's the same slide, that's the same, uh, that's the signal-to-noise ratio of the D to D user in the absence of interference. Now, if you look at the red curve below the horizontal line, okay, that's the actual curve in the presence of interference. And you see that if you actually use a zero forcing solution, the, does this work? Can I point? Okay, so if you look at right at this point here, Okay, what you're seeing is that the, at the zero forcing solution, okay, of course you've nulled out the interference and the, and the D to D is performing as it would in the absence of the interference. It was performance just on the basis of its signal to noise ratio. The problem is you're really killing off the cellular link. That is to say, it was operating about 19 dB SINR to begin with and now it's down to something like four or five. Okay, so by appropriately tuning, you can then selectively degrade the performance of the D to D link and enhance the performance of the cellular link and come to some compromise. So that's the first of these four projects that I, that I wanna quickly overview. There will be a, um, a poster on this one, I know for sure, possibly all four of them. Okay, the next one is by Young Han and uh, Tara. It takes a totally different approach. It's based on network information theory. So the setup is what you would expect uh, from an information theoretic approach. You try and you abstract the model into something which is tractable, and you worry about things like the asymptotic rate and uh, how you optimally encode to achieve that rate. And so in the first year, this is the approach, this is the problem that Young Han and Tara were looking at. It was a broadcast problem, it was a broadcast channel. If you look at this, Picture here, you have one user, number one, broadcasting uh, a message to N minus one other nodes. And again, the problems were uh, what I was saying before, uh, what is the broadcast capacity and how do you achieve the coding? And the results, the key results that, that Young Han and Tara determined were listed below. Uh, the most interesting or really are the following, that the, mo the most common schemes for, for, for this type of uh, architecture are not uh, decoding forward and they're not routing, okay? Rather, they require interaction between the different nodes uh, at, bo at both ends. And in fact, the, um, perhaps the most interesting result that he came up with is um, 
if you do this interaction, this, this back and forth, even a finite number of times, uh, that too becomes insufficient. Um, it takes potentially an infinite number of iterations like this before you actually achieve what you want to achieve. Something, of course, which is a, a very interesting analytic result. It's perhaps a disappointing result if you're dealing with a, a delay-constrained application. In any event, uh, that was the first year's work. Uh, this year, uh, Young, Han, and Tara are concentrating on a two-way interactive link. And again, they're asking the same type of questions. Uh, uh, what can you achieve, and i.e. capacity, and how do you achieve it? What is the optimal coding? Okay. And the techniques they're using for this one are listed at the bottom, combinations of distributed control and, and dynamic programming. So that's the second, that's the second project. The third one uh, is done by Tu Nguyen. He's a doctoral student of Pam Cosman and myself. And it's, there are really three projects that were sub-projects that were involved here. I'll quickly go over them. The first two are what we did in the first year, and the third is what we're in the process of doing right now. Uh, the idea is uh, how to efficient, efficiently transmit uh, video over D to D and or uh, D to R to D. So the first one was actually an, an offshoot of a previous project on 60 gigahertz through CWC, which ended before the research ended. Okay, and so the, uh, the idea here is this is an indoor link. There's been lots of work that's been studied on, on the performance of 60 gigahertz links in an indoor environment, and one of the key problems is a, a link break. That is to say, someone, a link break due to a human being walking between the transmitter and the receiver and breaking the link. Okay, so the, and so the point is with, with appropriate beam forming, you can actually establish a very strong line of sight here in this type of a channel. Okay, but once the link breaks, then you suffer big degradation, and so the question is can relays help you? Okay, uh, and uh, this is the only other thing I'll show you on this particular topic. Uh, it turns out to be a sensitive function of the probability of a link being broken. So for example, in this particular case, there's a 20% probability of, of any of these links being broken. In particular, the direct one is what you're worried about. And what's being plotted here is the expected distortion. Notice that, that we, I will not be dealing with probability of error here at all in this part of the talk, because we're talking about the application. It's distortion that matters, not the bit error rate. So the abscissa, sorry, the ordinate is the expected distortion, and the abscissa is the signal to noise ratio. And if you look at the very top curve labeled n equals zero, n is the number of relays, and with no relays at all in this particular link, with, uh, with a relatively small blockage, you basically killed the link. Okay, now the number of relays goes up as you go down the, uh, uh, down the chart, and indeed, when you get to around four or five, surely six, you've basically gotten everything because the bottom curve is what would happen if you had an infinite number of relays. So, the, so that, was, that was done towards the beginning of this first year. We were basically finishing up something. But then we, we wanted to make the thing much more realistic to video. And one of the key aspects of video is that there, uh, the data is not uniformly of, of the, have the same importance. There are almost always different priorities that you give to different types of uh, different bits, different uh, components of the video stream. And so here we've, um, we've kept, uh, uh, to, to begin with, an information theoretic uh, uh, formulation in the sense that we have a Gaussian source, and we're not at this point using probability of error or anything like that. We're using uh, outage of the mutual information, which is not the best measure for something like video for the same reason uh, uh, I was referring to before. Uh, you're basically assuming capacity achieving codes with long delays. But, but keeping in that in mind for the time being, that is the model that we used. Um, and uh, uh, this is a fairly standard protocol. It was a decoding forward protocol uh, uh, described below. And one of the more interesting re analytic results that we got was the following. Given the type of protocol that we're using, where the relays only transmit, back, transmit to the destination, um, what they successfully receive. Well, then, of course, at the destination, you never know quite what you're going to get. You could get nothing, in fact. Or you could get any combination of just the base layer, which is the more important layer, or the combination of the base layer and the enhancement layer, which is what you would like. And so how do you optimally receive that? And what we started out by doing was breaking it up into two pieces, uh, one whereby um, this guy up here, where this guy up here where we're combining those signals that are whereby only the base layer was received uh, with the bottom guys here where both the base layer and the enhancement layer was received and then we're trying to combine them two jointly and this seemingly ad hoc method we can prove is globally optimum. 
Okay, and in terms of how it performs, um, this is a typical set of results whereby, again, we're plotting expected distortion, expected distortion versus signal to noise ratio. And if you look at a distortion, just to pick out a point of, say, 10 to the minus 2, we're picking up about a 2.5 dB of gain of signal to noise ratio. So lastly, on this particular topic, okay, um, this year, we're trying to make the final jump away from the, uh, in terms of making the model realistic. That, that is to say, we are replacing the Gaussian source with an actual video. Now, the previous work was done with superposition coding. Here we're taking a particular example of superposition coding, namely hierarchical modulation. Um, we're using, in this particular case, 16 QAM, but it doesn't need to be that. It is, the key point is that it's hierarchical. The key point is not the alphabet size. Okay, and, um, uh, and we're basically redoing everything. Whether or not we will be able to do something like this, show that maximum ratio combining uh, will be um, optimal, we don't know, but, but this is currently what is, what is in progress. And so then lastly, another project supervised by Bhaskar, in this case the doctoral students are An Nguyen and Yi Chao Wang, uh, and in this case, what they're doing is using a weighted cumulative distribution function as the basis for scheduling on an OFDM downlink. And so let me just quickly, and for sure this one has a, um, a poster, okay, and, and so I won't go into any numerical results, but let me just set it up. Uh, and you can read it, but I think maybe I can describe it in a simpler manner than, than what's stated there. If you think of a cluster model, Okay, then what uh, Bhaskar and his students are doing is setting up different clusters where the cluster is nominally controlled by a relay. So in, in maybe network terminology, the relay would be called a cluster head. Okay, but the cluster head doesn't have full control here. It's really still the base station that has control. That is to say the base station trans, uh, communicates with the cluster heads, the relays, that is. Okay, but within a cluster, the mobile devices communicate with the relays themselves. But what's unique here is that, um, among other things actually, but one of the things that are unique is that each of these clusters has its own priority. And the priority is given by, is, pre, is pre known, okay, and it can be based on any one of a number of things, whether it's the content, whether it's the, uh, of the information, whether it's the, uh, the, the, the uh, quality of the channel. Um, it doesn't matter what it is, but there, you, you pre known, what, you, you know in advance what these um, priority levels are. And um, the way, it, the, 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 the approach that Bhaskar and his students take is the following. If you have a certain number of subchannels available in the OFDMA waveform, you don't feed back, every user feedback some fraction of them. That is to say, it chooses the M best. So in this picture here, uh, out of a total of uh, five possible channels, each user would feed back its two best. Now, there may be many users feeding back the same channels. This is part of the, the randomness going on. But the specific approach is that, that the essence of the approach, I think, is embodied in this expression right over here. Okay, so uh, why is the instantaneous signal and noise ratio on the channel? Rather than using the distribution of Y itself, Bhaskar uses the, the distribution, which is the, 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 a function of the, of, the, of the instantaneous SNR, and that function is the cumulative distribution. What that does is map every one of these guys into a uniform random variable between zero and one. Okay, and he's doing this to try and ensure fairness in some sense, in terms of in the phraseology that you will see on, a, on a, the poster, uh, uh, minimizing some sense starvation in some sense of, of uh, uh, of any of these users in terms of their ability to get resources. But that's just half the problem. The other half of the problem is how do you handle the priority, and that's done with the weight, this W sub, w sub I. Okay. So again, I'm not going to show any, I'm going to stop at this point, actually. Before we thank Laurie again, I just want to say that, um, uh, as you noticed, this was in, until this talk we had general talks, and now we switch to specific talks about the projects. When we resume in the afternoon, we'll have more. 
uh, project specific talks and then uh, we'll have one minute presentations by the students about the projects that they will work on before we go to the poster sessions. So um, I want to once again uh, thank Larry, um, especially for so graciously handling the technical difficulties and let's break for lunch and let's meet again at uh, 1.10. Okay, thanks. <laughs>